Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler Unscripted. Now I love dive watches. I think many people in this, uh, in this field, in this industry love dive watches too, and many enthusiasts do too because it's such a clever way of incorporating adventure and, uh, and the great outdoors with human achievement and of course watchmaking. And in fact I'm producing this, uh, this episode of Watch Chronicle Unscripted with a thousand meter dive watch on my wrist, the Olic and Weiss C1000, which is a modern remake of their 1964 watch, which was in fact the first thousand meter dive watch. So I'll link the review of that to this video if you want to watch that um, in video form on YouTube. Now, of course, today's episode is a, is a podcast as such. On YouTube, though, you'll find a version with pictures if you want to, uh, to watch that with full annotations. Or you can listen to this on SoundCloud, iTunes and Spotify, amongst every other player of podcasts you can find, where you'll find the Watch Chronicle Unscripted podcast. But the question today is, are deep sea dive watches a total load of nonsense? Now, I wouldn't normally be quite so dismissive, um, and I'm someone who loves dive watches, so do bear that in mind. But a couple of weeks ago, I produced uh, an, an interesting piece, I think, at least in terms of what I normally do by comparison, about the Rolex Deep Sea and why, in my opinion, it's the finest dive watch, in fact, finest watch they make, because it's the most technologically innovative and the most clever. But today I'd like to look at some of the gimmicks which we see with dive watches, and I'm not looking at this from the perspective that you're never going to use the depth rating of a dive watch, what I'm actually trying to argue is that even if you were a professional using the depth rating of a dive watch, you would never actually have to. Now, to explain what I mean, deep sea dive watches are watches which generally have a water resistance of 300 meters or above, and these are watches which are designed to take the very limits of what the human body can, can endure in a professional diving context. Now, normally that'll be for occupations like, for example, exploratory diving for oil or, uh, or recovery diving. But the general gist is the same, and the same practices are used to get a dive watch to that depth. Now, the first consideration to, to make, and I would like to make the point at this stage that I hope to address some things which you won't have heard elsewhere, so do stick around for the whole podcast to be aware of where I'm going with this argument. But the first thing to speak about is expense. There is a huge amount of money to be spent on dive watches with higher water resistances. And whereas at the very low price ranges, there are instances where dive watches aren't capable of resisting the depth which they're rated to, which is really poor practice on the, the part of the brand. I'd far rather a lower rated water resistance on a watch, especially on the dial, than uh, an inflated water resistance. I think Seiko is an extremely good example of the right thing to do. The fact is that Seiko Turtles, Seiko SKXs, Seiko Sumos, these sorts of reasonably affordable Seiko dive watches tend to be able to resist an awful lot more than they're rated to. Some people have speculated that they could take well over 300 meters. And bearing in mind that these are professional dive watches, they should be able to take 25% overpressure, as in the same way as a submarine has a, a maximum depth and then a crush depth, which is considerably more than that, to give you that margin for error. And there is some speculation with Seiko's more expensive pieces, like the Marine Master 300, that this watch with a, a monoblock case uh, saturation diving potential, uh, an overall incredibly tough build. This could take significantly more than the 300 meters it's rated to, but it's only tested to that depth to keep costs down, and, and that's an interesting perspective to take. But in any case, the amount of money spent to get a dive watch to resist higher pressure, both in terms of making the watch more robust, and also in terms of testing the watch, uh, is considerable and sometimes just doesn't justify itself even if you are an enthusiast and you want something which assures technical prowess, which is something very exciting to have on your wrist. The second point to consider is once we actually enter the water. Now, if you're going to use your dive watch for diving, then the chances are you have a basic dive certification, dive qualification, which lets you go to about 18 meters in depth. You can then go deeper with, with further qualifications, for example, 30 meters, but you very quickly get to a point where you have to use mixed gases, as opposed to just air in, uh, in the canister on your back. Because nitrogen narcosis becomes a problem, where nitrogen within your body begins to blur your judgments, and there have been cases where divers have swum down as opposed to up, due to the confusion caused by this uh, gas within the, within the air we breathe, but under, under pressure the effect is more considerable. Of course then you move to mixed gas diving, and this opens many doors in terms of greater depths, where gas mixtures like uh, heliox, which is oxygen and helium, hydrox, which is hydrogen and oxygen, and then hydreliox, which is all three, you can get to much greater depths. 
And this is because it, you no longer have the same impact on your, your nervous system, which you would have with a, a nitrogen-based air. And so with this sort of gas mix, you're able to get to much greater depths. And really here, you're not limited by gas anymore. You're li limited to practicality. By that, I mean that the record for standard diving, mixed gas diving, but standard diving where you go, you descend and then you ascend in a single dive is about 350 meters. And to put that into, into context, consider the amount of breathing gas you need. I'm not going to call it air anymore because it isn't really, but consider the amount of gas to breathe which you need to go to that depth when it takes about 15 minutes to descend to that depth, but about 13 hours to come back up. Now, this is not only enormous in terms of the amount of gas you have to take down, but also in terms of the amount of risk involved, but also practicality's sake. The fact is that if you're working an eight-hour day as a professional diver, which is about the average, they'll spend 16 or so hours resting and then eight working, it's just not practical to take 13 hours to ascend. It's just madness. So it would be totally exhausting. And I suppose that the risk of error would, would grow with tiredness. But in this sort of way of diving, that means that 350 metres is about the limit. And bearing that in mind, the situation with a dive watch is, is fairly simple at this stage. A dive watch doesn't go anywhere where it'll take on helium, which is the biggest problem encountered by deep sea diver watches, whether they have a case which prevents helium entering the case or a valve to release it. There's no risk of that or any problem which that would cause because the watch simply has to resist the ambient pressure around it, which is considerable. But the fact is that most likely a simple Rolex Submariner or other 300 meter dive watch could handle this without any real problems whatsoever. Whilst at this stage in the podcast, I think it's important to note that the reason why helium entering a watch case is a problem. Now, many of you will already have read this or seen videos about this, but I'll just recap. The problem was discovered in the mid 60s during expeditions like, for example, the Conshelf expeditions, where uh, Jacques Cousteau and, and his team, as well as associated parties trying to experiment with this, descended for a, a period of time to live underwater for up to a month um, at different depths. And the problems encountered were that their dive watches were being penetrated by helium in the high pressure environment, which is a much smaller molecule than gases you would normally find in air. And so this was entering through the seals of their dive watches. And when they surfaced, this was becoming trapped inside the case or wasn't able to escape fast enough. And so you suddenly found a situation where you had a little box on your wrist with many, many times the ambient pressure inside it. And so once you surfaced, the, the watch case would tend to explode, blowing the crystal out of the front. And interestingly, this is something which is related to the Oleg and Weiss I have on my wrist, because the original version of that watch was a thousand meter dive watch, in fact, the first, but it didn't account for the need for a helium escape valve. And, and so uh, subsequent dive watches included them. That's why when you're diving without a diving bell, because these, these divers during those conshelf expeditions were living in a sealed compartment, if you will, on the bottom of the, the sea, in which they could be comfortable at that depth under, under the same amount of pressure as if they went outside into the water. So they were under considerable ambient pressure. And so the dive watches were also involved in the same sort of environment as the divers. So of course when they surfaced they had these problems. But let's now consider modern saturation diving. Now most modern saturation divers don't go much further than 300 meters. That's a thousand feet or so just because there isn't much call for it in terms of, of tasks and so on. It's, it makes more sense to send other equipment down, whether it's a submersible or, or various suits to go deeper than that. And from around that depth of, let's say, 300 meters or 350 meters, decompression can take eight to 10 days. And this, this increases with depth, of course. At extreme depths, there are further considerations. And this is a genuinely dangerous practice in the sense that at extreme depths, the very complex gas mixtures they have to breathe don't really solve all problems. So at extreme depths, nitrogen is sometimes added back into their, their breathing gas because the effects at great depth, and this isn't terribly well understood, cause neurological problems such as tremors. And this can, can, can ultimately be extremely dangerous. But the narcotic effect of nitrogen is sometimes used to offset the tremors, which sounds like an extremely risky process and I'm sure is incredibly well controlled. But this does, I think, serve to illustrate how dangerous this can be. 
And the, the most extreme example was when COMEX ran the Hydro 10 experiment. I mean, Hydro 10 is a fantastic name for this, but that was a 1992 experiment, which I don't believe was conducted in open water. It was conducted in closed conditions, where one diver spent two hours at 701 metres breathing hydroliox, which, which is a, an incredible depth to reach for the human body to be able to withstand. But this brings me on to what dive watches had to withstand to be there. Now, the dive watches used by that expedition were Rolex Sea Dwellers with a 1200 metre water resistance. But I'm prepared to say that actually I'm not sure they would have needed to have that sort of pressure resistance for some reasons. And if there are any, any scientists in the comment section, I would appreciate your thoughts if, if I do make a mistake here. But considering the way in which these things work, the reasons for a watch case needing to be extremely strong is to deal with a difference in pressure between the inside of the case and the outside of the case. And in normal diving, that's the difference between the exterior pressure bearing down on the outside of the case and the fact that there is uncompressed air inside the watch, which isn't force, isn't pushing outwards with as much force as the ambient pressure is pushing inwards. And so as a consequence, a watch which isn't suitably built will be crushed. So bearing that in mind, if you're a saturation diver in an air or a gas based environment in which you're living at great depth, how do you equalize the pressure between the outside of a watch case and the inside of the watch case? Well, it seems pretty obvious that you'd simply unscrew the crown. Now, most dive watches aren't water resistant with the crown pulled out. And so as a result, if helium can enter the case via the seals with the crown screwed down, and these are dive watches with considerable water resistance, then unscrewing the crown should allow the pressure to equalize between the inside and the outside of the case. Now, if that's the case, then you don't need a, ca a watch case which is able to resist the enormous pressure of surrounding water when you do exit the diving bell or the, the environment you're living in, because the pressure is equal between the inside of the dive watch and the outside. OK, so at this point, you may have recognized the fact that if you do that, you're going to allow helium into the case. And so when you surface again, or indeed actually any gas which enters the case, when you surface again, is going to blow the case up. Now, that is a possibility. But bearing in mind the fact that a helium escape valve is only different to a crown, if we look at a manual model, that is, like on, on an Omega Seamaster, is only different to a crown in that it retains a certain water resistance whilst unscrewed. And people said this was new on the new Seamaster 300M released a couple of years ago, the last time Omega was involved at Baselworld. But truth be told, if you look in manuals before that, those helium escape valves have always guaranteed splash resistance and some water resistance when unscrewed. So the only difference between this and a crown is that it doesn't unscrew completely and that it, it retains some water resistance. But if you're unscrewing the crown in air or gas as opposed to underwater, what difference would that make between a crown and a manual helium escape valve? Of course, an automatic helium escape valve as seen on Rolex and other, other brands does mean that you don't have to worry about doing this yourself, which does have its advantages. But bear in mind that if you have a dive watch like, for example, an original Seamaster Ploprof or a, uh, one of Seiko's professional saturation divers and you set the watch whilst at that pressure, you're going to allow gases into the case. So presumably you have the same problem, even though the case is designed not to let helium in, you're going to do it yourself by resetting the watch whilst at that depth. And if you're under underwater for a month, then you're going to have to reset a mechanical watch at some stage anyway. And so when you surface again, presumably just unscrewing the crown again, okay, it won't give you any water resistance anymore, but you're in a, a gas-based environment, not underwater, so what difference should it make? So I think this brings up the fact that the helium escape valve as a concept, and in fact a dive watch able to resist that sort of pressure, isn't really valid anymore at this point, because the whole concept is able to be negated or, or, or avoided by simply allowing pressure to equalize within and outside the watch case. But what do you think of this principle? Because it certainly seems like a rather simple principle in terms of avoiding an awful lot of additional technology, which, which costs a certain amount of money to develop. And what do you think of how this should be approached? Do you think this means that these deep sea dive watches aren't really fit for purpose because there isn't really a need for them? Or are you, like I, going to continue um, buying them uh, in future? I, I mean, I, I personally still think they're a fantastic demonstration of technology. It's really quite marvellous to think of your watch as a little submarine on your wrist. But tell me what you think. I'll be very curious to hear what you have to say in the comments section below.
And of course, remember to like, share and subscribe to this, uh, this podcast on YouTube or wherever you're listening to it, because it really helps us to produce more. So thank you very much for listening. This is Armon from WatchConquer.com, out.